So we are kind of juggling here two things, the, the, uh, the audience and the auditorium, that's kind of big, and, uh, and the, uh, the audience online um, on our back. Um, so we'll have you know, this uh, juggling act of kind of interacting with you guys, but also with the audience in our back on the back. Um, welcome to um, Young Borderlands, uh, an event that is piggybacking on the 16th uh, meeting of historians of the U.S. and Mexico uh, that is being, uh, it's happening on campus, uh, began on Sunday and we will stay with us for a couple of days, uh, it ends tomorrow, I think, or Wednesday, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, these are all distinguished historians uh, doing either Mexico or US uh, or Latin American history um, convene on a question. The question is whether we can do a history of, U of the US, Mexico, Latin America in the 19th century, liberalism, emancipation, capitalism, uh, that is not nation state centered. Um, even the historiography today of U.S. history, for instance, Alan Taylor. Um, Alan Taylor has written all these books on plurals, American colonies, uh, American uh, 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 revolutions and American republics. Uh, even though he's expanded the geography of America, his books are ultimately about the U.S. U.S liberalism, U.S. capitalism, U.S. republicanism. Um, and the same applies for Latin America, Mexican history. Uh, it's also very nation state focused. Uh, and when we want these two historians to meet, they usually meet either on the narratives of empire, uh, U.S. expansion to Texas, U.S. expansion to the Southwest, taking over half of Mexican territory, uh, where Mexico is essentially uh, appears as uh, victimized by US expansion. And um, uh, on the other hand, borderlands. Borderlands is the other space where uh, these two uh, spaces meet and they have their own specialized historiographies. And those historiographies usually tend to present uh, Hispanics, Mexicans, Latin Americans uh, as, as um, borderlanders. Uh, not necessarily central to the history of liberalism, history of emancipation, or history of capitalism in the 19th century. Um, so we're trying to address that question, whether we can write a history of these two things uh, that decenter the nation state. And for that, we have invited um, uh, all distinguished scholars in the panel, Erika Pani, for those of you who want more details about the panelists and all their Awesome Vitas, please look up the uh, the link on uh, on this on the page for the event. Uh, they don't need much introduction. They are uh, Eric Bani and the Colegio de Mexico, a distinguished historian of 19th century Mexico, uh, La Reforma in particular, uh, and Mexican Empire, or Maximilian, uh, and others. She's uh, kind of done uh, uh, significant interventions on that. That, that historiography and recently wrote a book, uh, Historia Minima, on the history of the US uh, for Mexican audiences. Uh, then we have Celso Castillo, uh, who is um, a Vanderbilt associate professor who is uh, worked mostly on the history of citizenship, 19th century citizenship and abolitionism and emancipation in Brazil, who is now moving to a more continental history of emancipation. Um, in 19th century Latin America that also involves uh, a dialogue with the US. Uh, John Tutino, whose uh, work on the Bajio and uh, capitalism, the origin of capitalism, challenges us to think uh, the origins of capitalism from decentering the origins of capitalism 
to places other than Manchester. Um, <laughs> And um, Lina del Castillo, uh, who is an associate professor here in the uh, uh, University of Texas at Austin, who has worked on the history of liberalism and republicanism in Colombia or Gran Colombia in the uh, early 19th century, or the first half of the 19th century, who is now uh, uh, working on uh, the history of the Colombian Empire uh, in the 1820s. Uh, so a polity that wasn't just Gran Colombia, but so itself as an empire uh, with significant uh, uh, repercussions for the understanding of geopolitics in the 1820s. It wasn't just the British, the, the Americans, the French, and the Spanish, but also this, this, this empire, Republican empire, Colombiano. Uh, so these uh, four panelists uh, will have 10 minutes uh, to introduce their topics to kind of uh, suggest us all how to go about writing this more continental, more generous history uh, of liberalism, emancipation, republicanism in the continent. Uh, first, we'll have Erika Pani, then we'll turn to John Tutino, 10 minutes, then uh, Lina, uh, 10 minutes, and then Celso. Uh, and then we'll open up for a discussion with the audience in front of us and with uh, the audience in the back. And Jorge Canizales is the director of the Institute, uh, of historical studies. And I want to thank two individuals in particular who helped to organize these. Uh, Courtney Miller, uh, who is kind of the, the brains behind this operation and the uh, logistics and the whole thing. Um, and, and Diana Heredia, who uh, is also our assistant graduate uh, uh, research assistant to the Institute uh, and who came up with these beautiful uh, Poster that's not available right now. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 so we can this into this uh, event. Um, so, without further ado, Erika. Thank you. Uh, and I'm very grateful to, to UT's Institute for Historical Studies and to Professor Canizales Esguerra for this opportunity to talk with my brilliant colleagues at both sides of. Uh, the room and put our heads together and think about writing entangled histories of these two North American republics. Uh, I think in a moment which is particularly interesting because the two politics, the two polities are no longer part of the same imperial system and the nation state uh, is conceived as the most important and in some ways a somewhat autonomous actor in the reconstruction of the past. And I think that entangled histories help us kind of all these things apart. Uh, I think that before we ask how we can write an entangled history of the two North American republics or of the American continent uh, on that matter, we need to ask why. Why do we want to do this? No, it's not like Everest, so it's there, so we have to find it. Uh, I think it has to be somewhat useful. Uh, so what does transnational, a transnational perspective, uh, the perspective on, of entangled um, history, a focus on shared processes, on interactions, what does it let us see? What might have we missed if we had stayed within a more traditional uh, national uh, perspective? So we do have a very robust history of binational relations, long and respectable uh, journey, um, a newer but also very suggestive borderland uh, studies, which has been very dynamic and I think has, has taught us a lot about both national histories. Uh, but do we need to tell, go beyond this and tell Mexican, uh, 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 one story of Mexico and the US? Uh, Mauricio Tenorio, who always thinks brilliant thoughts, uh, says that it's very important that both nations are so important to each other that to write about one without writing about the other is like sitting in a room and, des and describing only half of it. Uh, that they're really, if you're not putting the two histories together, you're not writing half of the story or at least part of the story. I am not completely convinced with the metaphor, uh, but it is true that when you write about Mexico's 19th century um, and in my experience, when I wrote about immigration and naturalization laws in Mexico, uh, 
during these very turbulent mid, uh, mid 19th century decades, I did become convinced that you need to look at common threads and you need to weave together uh, this common history. Now, if you, we, I think, have this idea that immigration and naturalization uh, law, there is nothing that is more national. There is nothing that is more uh, gener that, that generates, that, that it reflects nationalism, that it reflects the nation's self-image, its needs, its policies. And what one sees when one looks at North America is that having the US in the middle really changes the way Canada and Mexico write their immigration laws and the naturalization laws, and that this in turn influences the way the US thinks about immigration, people coming from the outside and borders. Um, so in if we stick to politics, because there's so many other areas where there's a shared uh, historical experience, I think that there are three instances that matter uh, because they throw light on now, in, in this case, on the crisis that leads to civil war on both sides of the border in the, in the mid 19th century, no? and influenced the way the Republic was conceived and then how it was, how it collapsed and then was put back together again. Uh, I think that there is one way of approaching this, which is comparative analysis. No? The architects of the nation state responded to challenges which were in many ways similar, and they tried to respond to them on unstable, contentious ground. And I think that this really allows us to see how uh, there is no exceptionalism uh, and that there, there, that there are um, many things that, that uh, these, these republics have to face. Uh, they also suggest the fault lines in Republican Policies, the political on, on how they affect political visions and their implementation. And I think that to do this comparative analysis allows us to better understand the role that these things that we have naturalized in the history of politics in these nations. I'm thinking about political parties. I'm thinking about uh, religion, but I'm sure that we can come up with other with other examples and the role they play in politics. Uh, we, we, when we do comparative analysis, I think we can denaturalize them, decenter them, and that we can look at them from different perspectives. Uh, on the other hand, there are there are instances in which the politics and the political developments in one country influence the politics and the politicians in the others. So neighbors' experiences allow one to hold up a mirror to one's own natural own national development and this vision is looking at constantly looking at each other, shapes aspirations, uh, writes cautionary tales, engenders fear. And I would say a good example of this is this idea of Mexicanization in the US so in, the 19th, in the 19th century, which is also present, for instance, in the Canadian debates about confederation or the danger of becoming like that republic to the south, much more to the south. They're scared about becoming like the Republic to the immediate South also, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, and then interaction. Oh, th this is when we're really talking about entangled history, which a lot of this entangling happens at the borders, but it also happens through diplomacy, through trade, through um, through political political relations outside of, of, of I would say, formal formal channels and formal actors. And I think this shapes really the larger the larger context in which these politicians are moving. Uh, it shapes the political possibilities and the responses that each nation can have. Uh, war, interaction on the ground and at the border, diplomacy, geopolitical uh, transformations. No? And uh, so this, I would say, is kind of like the strong argument of the project that I'm trying to, to put together. No, the outcome of the Mexican-American War reorganizes the continent, reorganizes North America, and puts both countries on this path to political polarization. And it is the US Civil War which makes the French intervention possible and also changes uh, Mexican, uh, Mexican, Mexican history. So I think that shifting 
between these different uh, vantage points allows us to look at this complicated uh, phenomena from different different places and in that way does um, give us different visions of these political experiments that was the, that were the construction of nation states in the new world. Thank you very much. John, thank you. Thank you, Erica. We did not consult at all, but listening to her, what I'm going to try to do is put a big frame around her focused talk. So there may be coherence. Yes. Um, so, and I step to a bit more, perhaps extreme view. And I'm going to say the only thing national in history is the state and the law. That almost everything else, the socioeconomic, have been at least transnational and often global since the 16th century. And most social and cultural outcomes are local, regional, not national. So when we take the national focus as the center of history, we are, I want to go so far as to say, misleading ourselves to a degree, making. And I won't go into, I know how all the pressures of life says we should write national history. All the funders of life say we should write national history. But it's time to, I believe, move beyond. So, I'm going to try to do a rapid run through of developments of what I'm going to call the long 19th century um, to make this case. And in a way, it frames what Eric has said right in the middle of what I'm going to do. But I want to start with what I want to call the macro demographic curve, which is if you look at the Americas, including what became Mexico and the United States. They all shared this disease-driven 80 to 95 percent, we can debate the, the edges, this disease-driven collapse in the first century. So that suddenly, relatively, there's nobody left in the Americas around 1600. And then there's a bottom. And then there's a period of slow growth, different a bit in different regions, from about 1650 to 1950. And then we are all the products of the unprecedented population explosion. And that sort of unbalanced, I, I kind of do this too often, the collapse, a slow growth, and then an amazing growth. That structure structures everything in the Americas, in Mexico and the US. Everything that happens, happens within that context and it's a changing context. All right, now to a more event focus. I'm gonna start out in saying New Spain and British North America, neither nation existed, got simultaneously entangled in the global wars of 1757 to 63. And out of that, both faith demands, by the way, despite the rhetoric of US history, the British gained next to nothing, Spain gained the entire Louisiana territories. Gee, who won those wars in the Americas? Though we're taught to think that the British gaining of Quebec and Canada was a global triumph. Give me a break. Um, the end of the war, both empires said, you must pay for the war. The Brits said, no way. And it took 10 years. And in refusing to pay for the war, they led to the war for independence. The Folks of New Spain said, A, we don't really want to do it. Some mine workers rebelled and said, gee, it might be disrupted. And the silver economy paid for it anyway. So simply, New Spain not only carried on, but rose to unprecedented heights in the global economy in the 35 years from 1770 to 1810. I guess that's 40 years. Um, then, 1776 to 83. And I'm just going to say this blatantly. New Spain paid for the U.S. war for independence. New Spain, you always see that Spain paid. No, Spain didn't have a penny to pay or a peso. <laughs> um, New Spain delivered 4.5 million silver pesos to fund the U.S. war for independence. It was so pivotal that the U.S. adopted the peso as the dollar. And for historians of the period I study, the Monies are identical from then till 1846-47. See, that's an interesting year for the, for the <laughs> monies to break apart again. So they shared a money for pivotal transforming periods. All right, next, 33 years ago, U.S. struggles to consolidate as a nation. New Spain booms. 1810, 
Napoleon messes up everything. Um, Hidalgo rises and collapses. And popular insurgents in Guanajuato and the Mezquital de Real del Monte break the silver economy. They cut the global money supply by a third in two years. And I always remind people, at what percentage of the break of the global money supply do we scream? 0.2%, 0.3%. Imagine what a breakage of a 30% of the global silver supply. China was only on a gold, a silver standard. It's an enormous break. The, the actual numbers may be debatable, but it's enormous. The Chinese export economy collapses, the cotton export economy from India collapses. And while they'll never refer to the events in New Spain, which it still is, the all the historians of Britain say, gee, it was between 1812 and 1815 that British mechanized textiles finally surged ahead of Indian exports and took over the world cotton economy. Why? Because there was no more silver to pay for the Indian cottons that paid for African slaves that went to the new world to generate the plantation economies. And Again, running through this quickly, the rise of British mechanized cottons followed by US mechanized cottons. What do you know? Cotton and slavery drove left across the US toward this place called Texas. Um, and it is an, a, a direct sequence in which that insurgency drives the expansion of the US Southern slave economy. And of course, that while Mexico is trying to come out of that decade of insurgency and consolidate itself. The US, much longer post-independence, is driving forward. And while again, the US texts don't like to say it, the Southern cotton economy accounted for 60% of the US economy before the Civil War. Um, it's surging forward. Um, and mid 1840s show up, and I've recently been able to document, and I will say impolitely, the new book will be out in about a year to a year and a half. Um, and not only did Mexican silver rise toward pre-insurgency levels, in the key center of Guanajuato, it exceeded pre-insurgency by 40%. At the same time, there is a soaring industrialization in the Bahia. At the same time, the insurgents had revised so that the grounding is family agriculture. And again, to simply tantalize, but reflecting on last evening's talk, the leading silver entrepreneur in Guanajuato from the 40s through the 50s during the peak is a woman. And the new agrarian economy is overwhelmingly shaped by women who asserted themselves in the insurgency and carried on long after. So I'm going to stop there because we have now had the war in the U.S., right? We know what happens afterwards, the debates about slavery in the U.S., liberalism, and all of that is integrated and comes out of that early history. Um, the U.S. gets to, right, Union victory in 65, liberal restoration in 67. Um, from 1870, there's a new relationship, but it's inseparable. Key points we don't often think about. In 1873, remember, silver has gone back to the levels of 1810. In 1873, the wonderful US, having, shall we say, liberated the gold of California from Mexico, and I've now been able to show that they knew it was there. This wasn't a post-war surprise. It was well-documented in both English and Spanish texts that it was there, um, that having liberated the gold, the US joins England and Germany in turning to the gold standard. So the industrial world demonetizes gold and makes what had been New Spain and then Mexico's leg up in the world no longer monetarily significant. The irony is production soars, but its value doesn't for the rest of the 19th century. Um, so, 1870, 1910, the US and Mexico consolidate and stabilize US capital and markets. Silver declined. The industrial dynamism of Mexico recedes. And Mexico, for the first time, 
becomes an export economy in the traditional sense. Coffee, livestock, Hennepin, copper, petroleum, et cetera. 1910, we think of it in this room as the decade of the Mexican Revolution. In the history of capitalism, it is the decade of the global crisis of capitalism. And it is the, the decade in which the Mexican Revolution, World War I, and the Russian Revolution coincided and broke the century of industrial capitalism that had become in the 1810s. Tried a minor revival in the 20s. We know how that didn't work. It was called the Depression. Um, and World War II went forward. Um, and so again, you go through another decade of revolution, and we all want to think, I love studying the Zapatistas and their local social challenges, the Yeastas, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look carefully, the victory in the Mexican revolution of the 20th century came at an intersection in which the US we now know armed and recognize the Carancistas, shall I call them the most conservative of the revolutionaries, um, while they were funded as Mexico became the primary oil exporter in the world during the First World War that is oil and energy driven. Um, and on the side, war is also stimulating Hennigan. Um, and so the constitutionalists are so you can't understand the Mexican Revolution apart from its part in World War II, the great global changes of World War I, sorry, World War II. II. Um, we all know the radical constitution of 17 promised everything and delivered very little in the short term. It was only the depression of the 30s when global capitalism collapsed and made Cardenas' reforms I wouldn't say limited, but important as they were, um, simultaneously necessary and possible. Um, again, the global context having set the national outcome. And then to finish this rapid, and you know, we know, thanks to the world of Adolfo Gili, that out of this ability to get US acquiescence in the oil nationalization was precisely because FDR saw the war coming and said, I'd rather, you know, keep the oil flowing, no crisis of oil. And FDR, against much advice, accepted that. And then, Adonis himself names his successor, becomes defense minister and transnational broker, and he leads the way to sustain the U.S. with workers, exports, more, 500,000 Mexican citizens served as soldiers drafted into the U.S. Army during World War II. Um, again, a totally transnational event. And I will just quit by saying my own view is NAFTA began during World War II. Everything else is just negotiating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that brief survey of 19th and 20th century capitalism and warfare, <laughs> we turn to <laughs> Lina Castillo, who gave us a brief introduction to geopolitics in the early 19th century. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. And thank you for um, uh, the opportunity to share where my current research is at um, in ways that allow us to think um, or rethink the connected entangled histories of not just US and Mexico, but also hemispherically. And so following up on uh, Erica Penny's and John Tatuino's talk, which just is uh, so impressive, thank you, <laughs> allows us to, um, especially kind of thinking about kind of what are the approaches? Are we gonna go uh, in terms of comparative history or uh, kind of a mirrored view or connected history, as Erica is mentioning? Are we going to think about periodization and think of a long 19th century in order to think through what that, um, what these histories could mean? Um, where I'm coming from is, I'm going to go maybe more shorter in the time period, but a bit different in terms of the geographic scope. Um, and going beyond, of course, and because I'm rooted more in a Colombian historiography, I'm addressing a more hemispheric approach and where I'm going from. So I do want to think through um, a moment, uh, a moment of kind of thinking through the periodization of different events and in that sense. So um, for one part of my study, what I've 
want to reconsider is the meaning of the Monroe Doctrine, for instance. So oftentimes the Monroe Doctrine and scholarship on the Monroe Doctrine involves, of course, President James Monroe annual message to Congress on December 2nd, 1823, as a kind of origin story for US Latin America relations moving forward. So we either have the United States subsequently hooking its talents on the region, or somewhat similarly, we see Latin America as placed beneath the United States thereafter. So in questions about thinking about, well, why would we think about a connected history or an entangled history? There is a politics behind thinking through of a passive Latin America that is uh, acted upon by other players, especially the United States. And the Monroe Doctrine allows for a kind of framing of a transition from a European acting on the region to a United States acting on the region. Um, and of course, we also carry more nuanced narratives that recognize that at the time of Monroe's speech, the United, St the United States simply did not have the naval power or resources to back up a unilateral US protection over the Western Hemisphere, which is kind of the narrative that we have of what the Monroe Doctrine was doing. Uh, the British Empire is therefore invoked as the force that deterred potential European aggressors in the hemisphere in the wake of the Monroe Doctrine. Okay, so that's kind of the general narrative that we have of the Monroe Doctrine. But what if we place the Monroe Doctrine um, instead of kind of origin story moving forward and move it instead towards a context of the Monroe Doctrine squarely within the age of revolutions? I argue that this framework would not only shift our perspective on the Monroe Doctrine, but also on the age of revolutions. And that's because to do so, we need to go beyond a Monroe Doctrine that centers the United States and the British Empire and the French and Spanish that potentially would invade from the Caribbean to think through on rethinking of what role did Spanish America, Latin America, especially Spanish America, what role did they have in the emergence of the Monroe Doctrine? And um, at a time, kind of the um, Pan American Congresses at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, um, and especially kind of, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of literature in the 20th century about how um, there was very much an active role by Spanish Americans in the diplomatic negotiations that led to the Monroe Doctrine, especially in relation with uh, James Monroe, Manuel Torres, who is a representative for Colombia and Philadelphia, and several others who were involved in the thinking through of what a Monroe Doctrine could entail. And it involved very much an active role by Spanish American re representatives in trying to shape a kind of policy that was not a unilateral United States policy, but rather a hemispheric multilateral approach in order to think through, well, what would this mean for um, a unilateral approach to um, that's separate from the British Empire and that is pushing against reinvasion by Spain or France. So, in other words, we'd read to carefully, so to kind of recenter the Monroe Doctrine pure, and, and periodization, it would mean to carefully think through the active role played by Spanish American polities and republics in the age of revolutions, that by the time of the Monroe Doctrine, they had mustered the geopolitical wherewithal to be recognized internationally. And this also marked a new moment into how our, the consternations can be thought about, um, given that fact that there is this recognition for these independent republics uh, beyond the United States. Haiti still had a long way to go, of course, but at least Spanish America. Um, so I'm gonna go over a little bit of kind of age of revolutions literature, right? So if we rethink kind of Monroe Doctrine in ages of revolutions, how might that uh, reshift our thinking about the age of revolutions. And so I uh, age of revolutions literature is yeah, so huge, of course. And um, and ultimately what it covers is the nature of sovereignty and how it shifted from the 18th century into the 19th century. And John Tatino, of course, um, did a very kind of quick and concise coverage of this. And um, but at the end of the day, there's this effort to decenter the nation state from this kind of patriotic, exceptional histories of the nation state. And yet the nation state still tends to be embedded within some of these narratives, often taking center stage or it's like the backdrop. Um, consider, for instance, recent works on US independence set in the framework of age of revolutions. Uh, so within the last decade, conferences, anthologies, monographs, and joint issues of journals such as the William and Mary Quarterly, the Journal of the Early Republic, this is in 2017, 
they um, have several works that look at uh, U.S. independence by placing it within the age of revolutions. And, um, and of course, what Jorge mentioned earlier, Alan Taylor's American Revolutions of Continental History, um, they do have this effort to decenter the United States, and yet it's very much a United States narrative within the context of the age of revolutions. There's some other works, for instance, Caitlin Fitz's um, recent Our Sister Republics, it does take a hemispheric approach by thinking about the connections between the United States Republics and Spanish American Republics, and yet it's still very much a U.S. story. So, but this one is a U.S. story that is taking into consideration how Spanish American Republics did play a significant role in how the United States was seeing itself, kind of that mirroring approach in many ways. Um, and of course, the recent bicentenary for Spanish American independence has generated a rich and uh, very broad literature on the process of Spanish American independence for different nation states from 1808 to 1826. But yet these narratives, of course, also tend to center the emergence of the nation state, even when the works that try to center the kind of place these within the context of the age of revolutions. So, um, so that's kind of the different literatures, but of course you also have the works that have been able to bring in US, French, Haitian, Spanish American revolutions as an age of revolutions, and those tend to be far more comparative. So both in terms of like single authored um, studies such as Langley in 96 or Kluster in 2018, or edited collections, the more recent um, or, or Armitage and Subrayama in, in the um, kind of global context of the age of revolutions. So is it possible to do a connected, entangled history of the age of revolutions in the Western hemisphere that decenters the nation state? Um, it's hard, <laughs> not easy. A few scholars have moved towards this. I build on works like Kate Mavitz, but also Janet Pulaski, uh, Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, Elijah Gould, and others who consider the emergence of sister republics or the kinds of revolutions that emerge without borders um, or the kind of cultural habitus that undergirded the revolutionary moment um, and how people engaged in similar practices that are not necessarily connected, but are uh, comparable in the sense that there's kind of, they shared a kind of language or a kind of um, way of seeing the world. And in that sense, um, what I'd like to do is trace how the print culture trail left behind by historical actors, that does help us see how they work to make and to communicate revolution in ways that connect places not usually considered together. But because those imagined polities did not come to fruition, even though we have this cultural pre-culture trail that's left in their wake, they're just not considered as significant enough to include in our historical narratives. And so um, that's some of the work by um, Gould that, uh, that I appreciate. And so that's kind of where I'm drawing here. And so in that sense, um, so my approach is to shift the center of analysis. So kind of thinking about uh, global age of revolutions, but instead of centering the United States or Europe, um, shifting it more to Spanish America and especially Colombia's paper empire. And so that's where I'm coming through and thinking of it, especially in terms of print culture around cartography, because it was during precisely this moment where there was an explosion in print culture around cartography that allowed people to see the world in potentially new and different ways. Um, and so just with a few minutes that we have left. Um, so let's think through. All right. So in 1825, Guadalupe Victoria commissioned the reprinting of the Portulano de América Septentrional, divido en cuatro partes. So uh, as per a very brief and helpful conversation with Alfredo Avila, because this is something that I've been working on. Um, when Mexico gained its independence as an empire, part of what it sought to do was to uh, adopt the territorial expanse that Cadiz had ca um, called for as an America septentrional. And so in 1809, Cadiz issued this Perlin chart, which allowed for a vision of what this America Septentrional would be like. And it was divided, divided into four parts. And so is Las Antillas. Um, and of course, Tierra Firme, Floria, y el Seno Mexicano, which by, so if the Mexican empire was thinking of adopting this form, then this would mean, of course, 
dealing with the fact of Florida being uh, sold to the United States or kind of uh, negotiated uh, the Adam O'Neill Treaty. Like this is the time when territorial swaps were happening pretty fast and furious. And so Mexico was very much aware of what that would mean. And as, as it was an empire, and so this is also a Portland chart that included Cuba. So it was a very useful one because as a Portland chart, it kind of got, gave you the details of navigation about how you would get to these different places and sail from port to port. And Cuba, of course, by this time was a very important um, focus for the Monroe Doctrine precisely because the whole idea was like, well, Spain and France are going to try and reinvade from Cuba. And so by 18... Uh, on Santo Domingo and Jamaica, also really important. I'll get into that another bit. But by 1825, you have Guadalupe Victoria now as part of a republic that's recognized by the United States, reissuing this Portland chart that um, is actually renaming. So yes, of course, the Antillas, but instead of Tierra Firme, we have Las Cosas de Colombia, Florida y Seno Mexicano. And so this is a Portland chart that's printed in 1825 by Guadalupe Victoria in anticipation of the 1826 Panama Congress, which among other things, it was not just about trade and trying to figure out kind of new trade negotiations and also the question of self um, of, of self defense by unification among these republics against a possible reinvasion. And so having a portal and chart that also was accompanied by like a 500 page kind of um, description of navigation around the area, all of this was geared towards thinking about actually invading Cuba. And so by thinking about the Monroe Doctrine in the context of what's going on with Panama and this unification of the Mexican Republic with the Colombian Empire and the fact that it saw Colombia as a potentially powerful enough empire to unify with in order to invade Cuba, then this is, becomes a much more significant potential threat within the context of the Monroe Doctrine that helps explain the geopolitical negotiations that ultimately led to um, the kind of maintaining of Cuba for Spain, as long as Spain does not invade again, although it tries. But then this is kind of a rethinking of it instead of just like sidelining Spanish America completely, this paper trail allows us to see this connected history in a different light. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. And good afternoon, and I'd like to begin by thanking Jorge for the invitation. Thank everybody here for putting on your lunch for a little bit, our friends on Zoom for joining us. Um, the team, the staff of the Institute for Historical Study for bringing us all together. Um, you know, one of the, I found really compelling the way Erika started in so far as the, the why, right? And, and, and what is kind of the impetus for taking on different framework, et cetera. Uh, which, in my view, um, from different kind of experiences I've, I've had and am having, um, it's ultimately more a conceptual than an empirical question. Right? I think that's a much bigger hurdle. Um, I think the topics that we study respectively, Republicanism, capitalism, um, political formations, as we just heard from Lena, I mean, I think we can find threats in a good number of possibilities. Um, and so I'll just say that in thinking about these kind of connected possibilities. Um, I, I've got like my two different points in my head, two different places. One is in the capacity, the role that I have right now as director of CLAX at Vanderbilt with the Center for Latin American Caribbean and Latinx Studies. And there the conceptual intervention is to bring together Latin American Caribbean with Latinx studies, right? And, and, and I know that's not, that doesn't rub a lot of people the right way, but but I just, I put that out there and I'm not going to go much longer to that. But I do want to say, if, if we're trying to be serious about this, like that's you know like it's, that's a little bit more uncomfortable, and I think that that might be worth revisiting in some form or another. The more kind of empirical part of my intervention and what I'm talking about and why I was you know I think invited here, you know, has to do with my um, perspective as a scholar of slavery and emancipation. Um, and just for background, I'll say that it's been mostly like in the last four to five years that I you know, started to dig in and dig in deeper into the respective literatures of. of uh, emancipation and slavery in both Mexico and the U.S., focusing on the 19th century, not only that in both places, but in particular in Mexico, there's um, the, the respective attention to slavery um, corresponds more to the colonial period, right? Um, and I come to this uh, having been trained as a Brazilianist, uh, the first book was about abolition in Brazil, as was mentioned. Um, and that experience is 
ways into this conversation insofar as there is a long uh, comparativist historiography, right? I mean, that's its own kind of thing, the US, Brazil, and, and it's been, you know, every decade you have a new iteration of that, um, and, that and that's not slowing down, right? So, like, so these kinds of conversations are, are, are part of scholarship that I've been involved in um, for, you know, for during my career. Um, and I come at this in this particular moment um, through a project that is focused on the circulation of Uncle Tom's Cabin in Latin America. And it's a multi-sided approach. Um, I will say at the outset that the, the, the research problem, my research focus is on anti-slavery culture production. Um, and I'm, you know, so I do look at it from different sites, so to speak, right? Um, but, but the anti-slavery culture production is, is what I'm really interested in kind of parsing out. Um, and Mexico City is one of those sites, right? Where I've done deep into the press, um, mostly the press, other uh, and, and other forms of print culture in the kind of mid 19th century moment. Um, and, and so they're looking at theater, looking at literature. Um, and that's kind of, that's the part I think that, that you know, sort of places me here at the, the table today. Um, and, and, you know, and, even there, if I were just to kind of grab, and so the project encompasses other sites as well, right? But if you were just, if it were just a U.S. and if it were just a Mexico City study, I mean, immediately one would say that conceptually you can't do that without thinking about the communication networks, thinking about the cultural influences, both sort of north and south, but also uh, Mexico, Paris, Mexico, Madrid, and, and other parts of, of the Atlantic world, right? So. Um, Insofar as the question of emancipation and how I think this kind of connected approach bears out in, in, in what I'm doing and how I'm kind of going about reckoning with it, right? I'm trying to be really self-reflective and I'm kind of going deeper into it because I, you know, focusing on what I want to ask, you know, you take stock of the respective literature, historiographies, and what those debates are, but also not lose sight of where you're trying to get to, right? Um, and and so I think it's it's important for me to in the process to analyze how emancipation processes. Have become woven into nationalist historiography, right? I mean, that, that in and of itself is an untangling that like needs to happen um, as I'm working through these different uh, respective literatures, right? I'm really interested in, in how institutions, uh, be it kind of public institutions, be it academic institutions, their, their, their intersections, and also popular traditions create these nationalist narratives, right? Because I think that that, again, that, that is an important component. If one wants to destabilize and dearticulate to some extent, the nationalist framing, one needs to kind of like focus on that and critically take that apart, right? So, um, so that's that's been one of the ways in which I'm kind of doing this, and and you know, and, and, and the other sites, you know, in Rio and to some extent Lima and Buenos Aires as well, right? So, like, I'm, it, it's it's these all there's this, this nationalist historiography and emancipation um, is it, 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 quite prominent in these respective places. So that that's what it's kind of um, it's been important to kind of think about that. Um, so as to be able to parse out when these historiographies, you know, start spinning wheels on the nationalist achievements, nationalist progress, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, part of that work is, is one of the reasons that explains why, you know, why I've you know, participated in this conference and in the previous iteration of Guadalajara, right? It is important for me to kind of understand you know, those kind of historiography, politics, historiography questions. Um, through, you know, what is, you know, the seminal space, I think, for, for thinking about Mexican history here. And, in, and it's been interesting for me to observe the relative number of papers and, and even panels, this conference, compared to the last one, that, that take up the question of slavery and some even questions of, of, of race. And, 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 and here, I'm talking about Africa, with respect to Afro-descendants um, and Blackness. Um, and 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 and, do, and seeing, you know, and I haven't gone back to the program before the Guadalajara meeting, but I, but I certainly noted uh, you know, more papers now, right? So like, what does that then mean about like the networks? What does that mean about the people of the program committees? What does that then mean about who's thinking about where? And, and certainly we've got the whole COVID context to like to, to influence these kind of situations as well. And then also like, okay, but that's one space, right? Another important space in so far as this field is considered considered very large is the Afro-Latin American studies world, right? And so it's a big conference coming up at Harvard and it's the second time that is kind of taking place. And there, you know, one then starts to ask yourself, well, why are there seeming to be more papers on more or less the same topics in one venue than the other venue, right? Um, and it's interesting. So again, these are just kind of historiographical politics questions, right, that are conceptual. That to me, it's, 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 it's you know, less in terms of the no amount of work being done, but in terms of like the framing and the spaces that are kind of uh, engaging these questions. Um, so yeah, so I just kind of, I wanted to kind of 
put this out there and so far as how it's uh, I'm not you know getting I'm not a panel later on this afternoon where I'll you know actually talk about the project. I didn't think that this was the space to do that, but as, as a kind of point of departure on my reflections about um the history of emancipation and their connectivity. And, and yes, empirically, yes, they are connected. And I think that like that might, you know, especially when you're interested in questions about politics and I mean any dimension, I think you're going to you're going to find threads that um, are worth fleshing out and, and um and you can see them all together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Erica's well, uh, provocation as to why, why, why do we need to do this? And let me tell you an anecdote uh, about why. Uh, 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 what was years ago? I think, yeah, a year and a half ago, I got this massive amount of e emails with death threats uh, and insults, but I was trying to look for it. <laughs> For the, the beautiful email, but I couldn't locate it right now. But this is because USA Today uh, managed to uh, make a brief brief introduction to the nation of, of, of uh, uh, an essay that I wrote on Arcade in Stanford on the Alamo as the, the first monument uh, of the uh, Confederacy at the time when people were kind of knocking down the statues. Uh, and I argue that the, the largest monument and the first monument for the, the Civil War is the Alamo, because the Alamo is all about uh, the emancipation and slavery. And the South, uh, that is the, the Easter, uh, the Texas planters, uh, won. And, and the monument for that was, was the Alamo. And so I got which is inundated by emails because USA Today picked up the, the, uh, uh, the blog. Uh, but the point here is that this is really relevant today, this question. This question, because it, it, it has the possibility of reframing uh, the core narratives of this nation about liberalism, about emancipation, and so on and so forth. So in the case of liberalism, uh, we have Latin American studies here that's a foil, and Latin American history in the 19th century is a foil for US narratives of uh, exceptionalism and uh, kind of be at the forefront of liberal and Republicanism thought, um, when in fact, uh, we know now that this is far more complicated and, 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 and the vanguard of liberalism and Republicanism is, is probably in the South, um, in, that is Latin America, what we would call Latin America, because they are actually trying to create the republics, uh, not predicated explicitly on notions of citizenship uh, that are white supremacists. Uh, they are battling those conceptions and therefore uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, of things that are happening in the South. Um, and also uh, these narratives we have of US, excuse me, Latin American failed republics. It appears that they are not really failed republics, uh, but they are uh, republics that are grappling with, with uh, the same issues that, that are being exposed for uh, in the Northern Atlantic, mainly public sphere, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Second Amendment that in the South we call and here we go, uh, Second Amendment, uh, militias, and, uh, et cetera. But, but my point here is why? Why are we studying this? Why is are this question relevant today? Um, and uh, uh, we have had many, many, uh, at least four, um, four um, takes on this. Um, and I think this is a time for us to to uh, open up the discussion uh, and have our panelists engage with this, with this I think, fundamental question uh, uh, of, of, of why this matters that goes way beyond the contents. And it's an issue, uh, a conceptual issue uh, that has to be, it has to do with the role of Hispanics in this country now, not as area studies subjects uh, or as history of minorities, uh, but as central to the history of this nation as is the history of uh, African Americans, not just as minority history as Black History Month, but as history uh, every month uh, that matters to the history of this nation. Uh, and that is true of Hispanics as well. So uh, this is an invitation for us, to all of us, to uh, engage with the panelists. And if you have questions, you have uh, ideas, uh, you're welcome. Oh, uh, Andrew, sorry. Um, thank you very much to all four of you. I'd like to um, focus on something that you said, John, about demography. You raised this fascinating 
made this fascinating point about the demographic curve mm -hmm. and how it, it was common throughout the Americas, certainly North America. Um, could, could you perhaps just add in an ad hoc fashion, perhaps each of you, um, offer some thoughts as to how that might have impacted Mexico and the US in the 19th century? Presumably, it had a big, big impact on federalism. The uh, populations are growing, and as populations grow in, in places that are uh, away from the center, uh, that, that produces uh, a greater demand for uh, local autonomy, uh, for states' rights, you might call it, uh, in both Mexico and, and the United States. But it also, the demographic growth also presumably helps the central government uh, grow an army or, or, or other uh, forces, uh, bureaucracy also, uh, uh, with which it can try and control those areas. So, so how do you see demography playing out in the 19th century in common between Mexico and Mexico? Uh, of course, the first escape is the benefit of doing such a rapid, simple overview is the answer to the important questions is it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thus I avoided all the complicated. Um, I mean, broadly is what I want to say, and incredibly broadly, relatively scarce populations to open resources. In my view, it's, it serves the base. It puts them in a position to organize press. They don't always do it, but it serves them. Growth against set resources, growth against limited resources, um, tends to facilitate concentrations of profit and power. Now, because the US and Mexico have different systems are in different points in time, right? So the US to boom its cotton economy in the 19th century, for example, the South remained too sparsely populated to in any way do that. So wonderfully, you know, we always emphasize US abolished the slave trade. Oh, we meant the international slave trade. This US South had this massive internal slave trade in which at least 600,000 folks were sold from the Chesapeake across the South where they reproduced to make 2 million slaves. So the South had to be repopulated to do that. And I want to say, Going back to the famous F.C. Domar theories, slavery often rules where there is sparsity, where you need work, but they got to be controlled because you just brought people to the South and take off to do whatever they wanted in an area of sparse population and you know low resources. So that's just one example. And other, the, the, so the context is similar in the broadest demographic sense, but the local. So I'll go to Mexico in the same time period. And the first thing I'll say is it's regionally different within Mexico. But so after the independence in the central regions around Mexico City, there is a demographic slowing and a real consolidation of power in the communities. And they are able to sort of hold their interests for that time period. I don't want to say they're flourishing, but they're not being clobbered either. Um, they're hanging on. And it's really not until after the liberals resume power in 67 that they face real pressures. Different in the Bahia, which has gone through a radical transformation, no indigenous communities, the populace has taken over production on the land um, via tenancies, mostly. And they use their low population, which shall we say got a little lower in insurgency, to really consolidate and assert themselves. So in Mexico, the sort of the coercive side, and so population growth is slow in the first half of the century, I think, in most rural regions, accelerates in the second half. That has something to do with what the liberals under DS really want. But that's just a small piece of it's complicated. Does anyone else like to hazard a comment? Just perhaps in terms of perception. Is that you both you have in both cases you have this idea of empty spaces that need to be populated, and what becomes populated, uh, I think, also is a clue as to what things are going on to shape this reality. So yeah. Mexico mm -hmm. goes through these you know, very very generous colonization laws. In the U.S., you have to pay for public land until eighteen sixty two. Here, there's no, we'll give you the land, you can have, you know, import agricultural implements without paying taxes. 
where do you have a successful colonization policy? Texas. <laughs> so just in terms of what, um, th there's this idea that they're both facing the same problem. They both, uh, the Mexicans are more radical than the than US legislators, but then what? It only works where you have this magnetic Mississippi Valley cotton mm. slave economy. Actually, having got me thinking longer, one of the other things I'd like to emphasize in this U curve, there, you know, U.S. history is marked by Western expansion, right? It's one of the dominant themes. The history of New Spain through Mexico is marked by northward expansion within. It starts in the 16th century. It's not totally exclusive. It's amalgamating peoples, sometimes incorporating indigenous peoples, sometimes excluding indigenous peoples. But the flow from Mesoamerica north starts in the 1500s and has not stopped, right? It intersects in the 19th century with another flow coming west across the US, which in US history is the only flow. That's the legitimate flow. And when the people who've been flowing northward for centuries sort of make themselves visible, oh no, that's unacceptable, that's a problem, which is a sign of what goes on in the national sphere. But it is that demographic emptying that drives first the flow south to north and then the flow east to west. Thank you. We have a question. Yeah, there. Oh, there are many questions. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, can I talk or can I wait for the, the question of the audience of the people that are present before? Just you, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for for your talk. Mainly, I am thinking about the knowledge the knowledge exchange during the 19th century between uh, Latin America and the USA. So I was thinking whether the most radical parts of the American Revolution had some influence within the uh, Latin American independence, like in this case, for example, Thomas Paine and his idea of the rights of man or common sense, because I think that there was some people that travel to the US and I don't know if those books entered in, in the Americas during that period. So I was thinking about this exchange of ideas during the period of independence. Thanks. You want to take that one? Sure. Um, so actually, yeah, very much so. So um, one of the things, the perspective that I take on this is, of course, there is very much circulation of um, ideas through print culture, for sure. Um, and another way I like to think about it is kind of how um, the U.S. process of independence after 1776, there's this idea of the United States that had been existing prior, uh, kind of earlier in the 18th century, but really became popular with independence, uh, which is, of course, a Colombia, but with a U, right? And so uh, after independence, everything in the United States was Columbia, including King's College in New York became Columbia University. There was journals that were kind of the Columbia uh, journals of literature. There was the Columbia River that was named right after independence. There was um, pretty much uh, in the wake of American independence, um, oh, Phyllis Wheatley, of course, which she, her poetry, she was African American poet um, who was championing independence and doing so as a kind of really decolonizing move from Britannia. And so the idea is that Colombia poetically is a kind of way of setting itself against Britannia. And she was championing a kind of ending of slavery poetically as part of this project for the American independence, which was, uh, of course, a very challenging idea that nonetheless was one of the kind of ways in which, uh, um, at least from the Northern point of view, there was a push more towards um, abolition of slavery in like the 1780s and um, not abolition, but at least gradual emancipation, eventually ending of slavery by 1804 in the North of, of the United States. And so you have this ideal of a Columbia in the this part of the in, in the United States 
that you have Spanish Americans coming through after, like around the times of independence and after, like Francisco de Miranda, who had, thanks to the financing of the silver of <laughs> New Spain, participated in helping um, win uh, independence for the United States, also running away from the Spanish Empire for different reasons, but he encountered a Colombia. And so this idea was something that he um, kind of drew on in terms of not just the print culture through poetry, but also through this very real um, kind of ethos that was happening at the time and carry it with him to Europe. And so this is where this idea of a Colombia emerged. And so what's interesting is that the kind of Colombia that really grabs hold in the United States, even though this is a project that then Francisco Miranda tries to sell to Spanish America, you don't have that level of engagement culturally, poetically, materially with a Colombian ideal. It's very much a kind of circulating along elites ideal of a Colombian empire. And it's one that um, circulates very much through printed cartography and networks of scientific knowledge. And so there's a lot of circulation, both of like independence ideals, but then also the ways in which what's happening in the United States can also be connected with the history of Spanish American independence. And that's why thinking about it in this Colombian register makes that so much more visible. So Colombia more than campaign. Yes. <laughs> but going back to John John's point that the, uh, the Nuevo, Nuevo España's silver, it's kind of at the, the center of the American Revolution in terms of finance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what about this historiography that emphasizes the American Revolution and puts it in, in the context of the Atlantic, but makes the French yes. the, the, the center and Spanish American and, and Spain and particularly Spanish American, even your perspective, uh, kind of uh, evaporates. Uh, and what in fact seems to be central and crucial as Alan Taylor in America's in America, revolutions uh, makes a point that the, if if we're going to 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 consider the uh, the impact of outsiders in the in, in the American American revolutions, it should be should be Spain that counts the most more than France. And you are reframing it; it, it should be Mexico that counts the most. Uh, the city of Mexico, because it wasn't Mexico at the time. It no, I know. I mean, I'm, I'm not just joking. Let me add. Can I jump yes. in and add a little bit and look yes, to our yes, question? Yes, or yes. Point here. First of all, why? I want to say because in the mainstream Western, that New Spain funded and enabled the U.S. and I even refuse to call it the American Revolution, the U.S. War for Independence, is somewhere between unthinkable and unacceptable. So it just cannot show up in the mainstream um, literature. I'll just walk away. In terms of the radicalism, from the way I see it, um, in the aftermath of the U.S. War for Independence, which I cynically say was also a war to preserve slavery. I mean, you see who its primary promoters were, and they pretty well succeeded in that 30 or century um, or more. Um, but in the aftermath, those looking for radical autonomous visions in Black America did see promise the notion of not being subject to Spain, especially because people knew where the real wealth and power was. It wasn't in Spain, it was here. There was some promise of that. The thought of political independence emancipation was thinkable. The intervening step is taken. And you can't look at the sequence if you don't recognize the intervening step of Haiti. That is the revolutionary war for independence that not only ended slavery, but ended plantation production. And it became absolutely unacceptable in places like New Spain. And so you have two models at that point. And one may have an ideal, but the other has a real caution and a real worry. Um, and I will note that my the late lamented Luis Fernando Granados in his last full monograph dealt with the impact of hate on New Spain and in the context of that. So I think that has to be in the middle of the sequence of the conversation to see how then many of the, the elites, to use the generic phrase in Latin America, were hesitant and slow, right? Latin, independence came out of places like Venezuela, Buenos Aires, I will politely say at the time, marginal to the wealth and power. Uh, and boy, this hesitant in the Andes 
and, and that's the alliance, the alliance of Bolivar with Petit in Haiti. Well, and he he's he gets some support at that time. I'm not sure he's able to really move. Um, I'm not anywhere close to the details of this independence movement, so I don't want to try to get in there. But my impression is, I mean, let me put it this way: he had to conquer independence on the elites of Peru and Alto Peru. That's where the money was. They weren't joining independence. They had to be conquered to independence. And let us say, um, the really powerful in New Spain took a long time to get there. <coughs> More questions? There's a question from the chat. Oh, question from the chat. Do you want to read it? Sure. Um, this is from a guest named uh, Ricardo Gomez Estrada. Thank you for your presentation. My question is for all the panelists and for Professor Canizares Esquiera as well. Why assume that a state-centered history cannot coexist with a history outside the borders? What history can be written while ignoring the reality that states continue to be important actors in the implementation of local experiences and ideas? States are not realities, but the crystallization of past struggles. Are they not? I'm actually happy to address that. I don't argue that states don't matter. They're pivotal. I, to be honest, I kind of think in three layers or levels of history, the macroeconomic global, which is out there, but the state, to be blunt, in the history of capitalism, the states define property and have to defend it. They define money. You have The state matters too. And so what I think we need to find is a way to engage the transnational and the global take the political, the state, the legal seriously, but then also recognize that the outcomes at the base are not national, but they are diverse and local. But yeah, I agree with the questioner's implication that the, the state and the politics of the state, we should get rid of them. I kind of want them in a more complex context. Eric? No, I would add to that, that many of the, of the men and women that study and I'd say, especially the men in this case, are absolutely obsessed with state image. So we can't write a history of politics in the 19th century without mm -hmm. taking charge of this obsession and you know put it in different uh, in different looking at it from different places in order to realize that the shape of the state and of this nation has as much to do with what is going on inside, with what is going on outside, especially in some places. It's not the same. The relation between the US and, and Mexico is not the same as the relation between Mexico and Colombia. Yes. And I doubt to that the, the state very much does matter. And it is, and the state is very much a think of states as processes helps a lot for sure. And to also think about states that um didn't come to fruition or were short-lived or were imagined as possible, and then there was a kind of an effort to bring them in. And then they didn't allow us to see the importance of states in this process of independence as well. So one of the things you brought up is the issue that the states are not only imagined as nations but as empires. Yeah. So it's not. So the question is not it's not the state. The question is the nation state in this case. Uh, and uh, and in in your case, just to dig in dig in a little bit more. So you have you have the, the also Mexico. You have and Brazil. I mean, they, these are politics that are imagined as empires originally. And in the case of Brazil, last the lasting one that, that lasted for, for like what six decades or seven decades yeah. afterwards. Uh, that 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 is a possibility that we have not even. But well, in the case of Brazil, yes. But in, in other in other in the case of Mexico, in the case of of, of, of Tierra Firme, Colombia, are things that we don't really investigate it enough, mm -hmm. right? people are starting to, the U.S. refused to recognize that it was imperial, but of course it was um, marching across the continent. Yes. Yeah, well, that the history of on 19th century U.S. has emphasized yeah. that he spoke uh, a, a nation without borders by a uh, hand. Uh, hand, sorry, hand. That emphasizes that, that, that we need to rethink the, the, the chronology of U.S. history, right? That it's not the Civil War, necessarily the, the turning point, but that both 
antebellum and postbellum uh, are about not nation state formation solely, but it's about imperial formation. And that the South is very much the leading force in the creation of empire uh, in, in, in the United States. I mean, very, very aggressive foreign policy towards the trans Mississippian and Caribbean uh, uh, politics. And that the, the, the thing that changes with civil war is not so much. Uh, empire, but it's the direction of empire that now goes to the Pacific and now goes to South America as well. But that 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 the the central to U.S. history in the 19th century is empire, not just nation state. Uh, and uh, I wonder, for the case of Mexico, how would that play out? Or... And I think that there there is work being done, but that we focus on empire as monarchical, a monarchical regime and not as expansive. When we really need to kind of look at what happened with Central America and with the far north, where we do have um, ambitions of expansion, but no, not the means to pursue. So there was the desire, but not the means. The, the desire, but not the means, I would say. Well, first one needs to be more careful. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for this. Um, just since Erica, you were bringing up kind of the, the way in which we need to grapple with the, the terms that our actors were using, their interest in the state, their investment in the state. And I'm thinking about Michelle Gobat's article about the origin of Latin America as a, as a phrase in of itself coming out of Latin America, coming out of an opposition, kind of a definition of opposition between the United States and Latin America. And as well as kind of things that are coming out of the United States defining itself in, in opposition to Spanish America, particularly to the South. And so I'm wondering about this entangled history that I mean, that in and of itself is an entangled history of, of self definition. But how kind of do we both um, kind of advance projects that are about bringing these histories together and entangling these histories together while also recognizing the way in which these kind of nations, you know, national actors on national scales, local scales, to John's point are less interested in these broader kind of transnational processes, but are very invested, as Lena, your work has also shown, in kind of creating a specific unit that is a national history, that is a kind of a bucket in which this particular set of processes is, in, is happening, even as we as historians can recognize kind of that, the interconnectedness of this. How do we still kind of value this, this deep investment in kind of crafting particular localized national histories and at the same time kind of pull them together. And maybe that's the entire intent of this panel. But I'm wondering about kind of respecting that that kind of investment in, in opposition from the era um, while still kind of trying to get at, at how these all are, are, are deeply kind of interwoven and, and inseparable kind of histories that we're telling in a wide variety of scales. So, so you want to try? Anybody? <laughs> I'm just going to say a little bit. One thing is what the prime, what the actors say matters. We have to take it seriously what they proclaim. But to me, we also have to recognize the pivotal importance of silences. There are things that aren't on the public agenda that aren't spoken about, and sometimes we can quickly see them as goals from actions, right? How many liberators have said they were liberating, but one way or another coerced some people into something? I'll stop there. So yeah, we've got to take what is on the minds and in the discourse of the actors. But it seems to me we just have to see it in the context they're working in and what they might be. And sometimes you silence on purpose. And sometimes things are so unconscious you really don't even recognize they're there. And all I'm doing is complicating the problem. I don't that's there's no way out of it there. But yeah. Say something about it. I would take that. In the abstract, right? I mean, I would consider you know, what the main research question or focus is, right? And, and I think that, like, where you have a process that is locally focused, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, that need not preclude you know, the analysis that you're talking about uh, being situated and connected to developments. Um, I mean, I think about you know Erika's book and 48. I mean, the conversation started this morning, right? And 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 like these these questions are are interwoven, right? And, and so I think. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I see your tension, but like it's also, uh, it's not insurmountable, right? right. I, I don't think it's necessarily, yeah. 
And it in itself is an internet connected history in yeah. certain ways. That yeah. notion that investment in opposition right. is itself a right. 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 It's a reaction to right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a self definition process. Yeah. But is your question about selling the project or no, no, no. Oh, okay. Okay. No. Okay, so it's no. just about exploring that that yeah. kind of in, investment in not being one thing, right? In not being a unified kind of sphere, but investment instead in. So I think that we should all aspire to the universal history of, <laughs> you know, coming from the institution of Luis Gonzalez. Yeah. Lena, you want to? Yeah, uh, just quickly, because I'm, I'm trying to, because I was thinking through because the historical actors themselves, as you point out, Michelle Gobas' work, I mean, many of them were were very much experimenting with this idea of a Latin America, like Francisco Bilbao, for sure. Um, and then thinking about how you know, Francisco Bilbao's address to Congress of, or proposal for a Congress included uh, national like citizenship for any member of one republic would have citizenship in another, which is something that in 1956 yeah. is pretty radical, right? I mean, so that uh, so there was the thinkability and the visibility of these projects that were were clearly not about just the nation state of a specific nation yet thinking about it in this global context. So it seems, I mean, I do think that it's interesting to think about, well, from there, how do we get to these national histories that will only, like in terms of public histories, when they did the bicentenary of Colombian independence, it was very much all about Colombia. And then the other ones, the other histories, the connected, the intergovernmental, like the global connections are kind of a little bit of a mess. I mean, so there's, um, there's a lot of different forces at work that are not necessarily just the historical actors, but also how then, historical actors subsequent to those historical actors will reshape and rethink and re and replace the the meaning of what those actions were and so that's that's the that's the biggest challenge just to plug in for one of our students Alex Chaparro who's not here and done research and Gobert he is kind of uh, investigating and showing that there is this wide public sphere in Spanish between periodicals all over the United States uh in New Orleans in uh San Francisco in New York in uh, 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 Philadelphia, where this category of Latin America is coming, coming of age in uh, periodicals in the United States. So it's not, it's not even in the region where the category of Latin America is being, it's not in Latin America, well, it is, but it's not just in Latin America that this category is being created, but in, in, in the public sphere in Spanish, in these cities where that category is being created, San Francisco, in the wake of all these uh, lynching of Chileans, et cetera. Uh, in, of course, in, in New York and, and, and Philadelphia, uh, and your means. So, uh, so it's, it's 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 both fascinating and very complex. And uh, uh, where the category of the nation state might blind us to all these uh, communities uh, uh, of Spanish-speaking individuals who are producing a public sphere in Spanish that are publishing on issues having to do with uh, anti-imperialism, uh, as Gobert puts it, uh, uh, to define a region. Yeah. Uh, that is not really in the United States, but outside. Thank you. Yes. I think I have a, a different version of exactly the same question, but less. Um, so one of the biggest tensions that I've been struggling with, with this broader question of trying to tell, in my case, particularly an interconnected story of Mexico and the United States in the mid-19th century, is how do we do this and move beyond sort of these big, high, abstract levels of constitutional history, of intellectual history, of nationalism, of internationalism? How do we tie in the grassroots experiences of people on the ground, especially in places like, uh, you know, in the case of Mexico, where regional uh, politics are so complex, are so diverse, right? How do we balance the two, this broad scale uh, you know, the macroeconomic and the transnational and the, you know, the grassroots base that you know, connect to it in such messy ways. That's kind of something. I grapple with that endlessly. And, and, and I, I don't really have any kind of answer. To surprise me. I grapple with it endlessly. Oh, no, no. They are the grassroots base is the toughest group to get a hold of, right? After, the tale I will share, and this has been a decades long, but the the book that should be out in the year <laughs> documents that insurgent communities in Guanajuato mobilized with no identifiable leaders. I've looked for two decades and can find no proclamation of intent 
or gold. They took down the global silver economy. They redirected global capitalism. Their only goal in all of this was to make life better in the local communities, to sustain themselves. In the process, women, I can document, took much more active, involved roles in family and community life. And the only place you can find this dealt with without anything close to the detail I just offered, if you read Lucas Alaman, great historian in Mexico, he details the total destructiveness of the insurgency in Guanajuato. And they are entirely destructive. They did nothing but destroy. And from his perspective, he's right. But they created new lives, but they are not in the public sphere. They are not in the agenda. I had to put it together way too long. I'm exhausted. <laughs> but, uh, um, and even then, the best I could do is part, as I would say. But to me, it's worth doing because may I be what I have found that while I fight to find that local reality that is often not in the public sphere, I have wonderful colleagues who generate what I need to know in the national <laughs> and global sphere. So in the midst of doing this work on Guanajuato in Mexico, my friend Eric Van Young provides me this amazingly detailed biography of Lucas Alaman. I didn't have to do that. Um, he delivered it to me. I don't have to agree with him. He doesn't have to agree with me, but I have all that research. And so the, the benefit of focusing below is all of my wonderful colleagues who do the national sphere, others who do the global sphere. Um, the answer to his question is that the local and this grassroots mobilization, it's thinking locally and, and, and the continental dimensions is, are just unintentional. It's uh, not well, that they, the, they set out. The global impact, why they did it, I'm not going to try to do it today, but it is global, both political. In other words, it's not an accident. This has happened in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars, um, et cetera, et cetera. The global, both economic and political, have much to do with why they did this. And they transformed the national and the global. You know, they set new parameters of the process for the national and the global. But their goal is making the family and the community viable. Yeah, well, that is Adam Smith's unintended, the law of unintended consequences. It's not that they were thinking continental. Right. Is that your question? That you are looking for evidence of individuals? In well, I think so. And what I'm interested in, and in, in, so my, my research looks at, at you know, grassroots ideology during these civil wars, during the, the 1850s and 60s, especially, right? So the question is sort of how people at the grassroots level are engaging with these ideas of global and national movements yeah. and how we can balance between those two scales. But I think what, what John is talking about is, is another dimension of that same yeah. question. Right? I, I'd it's, actually it's, love to ask you, if I can, where have you, what have you found as grassroots ideology? Uh, the nation is family in many cases. People okay. are using uh, kinship and uh, honor as sort of the functional grammar. And in what kinds of sources? Oh, uh, it's in official ideology, in newspapers and letters and okay. um, memoirs and diaries. Okay. It's all okay. Thanks. But what about you, Sylvia? What Your own research? I mean, I would, an analogy of sorts would have been, uh, you know, rewind 20, 25 years and the studies of Brazilian slavery, for example, um, there was a strong social legal reaction to the kind of top-down political approach to questions about abolition, right? And people have canvassed the country now, so to speak, um, at the local level with court cases. And, and, and so again, there's the contents, right? But then there's like the structure that emerges from this you know, legal apparatus that um, can give you insights into that dynamic as it's unfolding. Um, I mean, so I was curious about your answer to the questions about the sources because I think that that might be, I mean, you know, we're sort of talking about the petitions, right? I mean, as, uh, as a you know, place of analysis in and of themselves, like structurally, right? I mean, with that kind of thing. Um, and if I, do you often get find those in the press at whatever level, there's a certain level of the literates, but if you can get the narrative of court cases. The people at the very thing go to court, they speak their mind, it gets recorded, and you can, yeah, you have to worry a little bit, it's staying in court, but when you get 
the, the language in court. You actually can get the language of the illiterate, the non-literate, what they're interested in, what they're about. Well, and so I guess maybe to reframe my question is, is not so much how we get at those voices, but how we balance telling story of it in which we can talk about, you know, the, the broad macroeconomic and, and geopolitical scale, but also find a place for what's going on in the grassroots level and the way that people are both acting and understanding these broad mm -hmm. processes. It's complicated. <laughs> don't <laughs> not try. Don't not try. Uh, your actors are moving on ground that is become that it's not clear to what nation it becomes. So that I think is also the, one of the great virtues of your thesis. So we will hopefully see as a book soon. But but know that, that the fact that this is basically what's going on is going on on ground, which could be the US, could be Mexico, mm -hmm. or could be maybe something else, no? Sierra Madre, whatever. <laughs> any, any questions, any more questions? No? People are online, but I don't know if we're- Online? Uh, yeah, but where are we? The, the last question, and then we, we, we'll give them a break so they can have a sandwich and run. Okay. Uh, this comes from um, Inaki Herrera. Um, if I could ask, how should we approach transnational radicalism without falling into a nationalist narrative? And how do we really explain cultural relations to radicalism while maintaining a transnational framework within the context of Maganismo's movement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Transnational radicals. Uh, there were plenty in the age of revolutions, and and then anarchism was kind of, by definition, transnational radicalism. Any 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 insights on uh, abolitionists in the nineteenth century were kind of transnational radicals? No. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I mean, they did the Maganista stuff, right? I mean, that was part of the question, or no? Yeah. Yes, an example of transnational radicals, but. I, but Going back to our own subject, thank you, Sage, for now, my one instance. Sure. Um, and the question being about formation, cultural formations and their transnational networks, is that what we're, without falling back on the nationalist? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, to me, um, this kind of a question is, is actually at the heart of um, some of the work I'm trying to do now insofar as focusing on kind of problem of anti-slavery cultural production, um, where the end result isn't about, isn't a series of chapters on Uncle Tom's Cabin in Argentina, Uncle Tom's Cabin in Mexico, in Brazil, in Peru, and blah, 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 right? Um, I think that um, the networks that are gonna link social movements, networks that are going to um, create new horizons, um, I think, both that they're doing, and I guess that again, okay. I mean, but now that I think about this more, there is a tendency, and this is the abolitionism work, but it, I would I'd probably guess and it applies to other kinds of movements of, of the life that imagine themselves this way. To while you're focusing on, let's just say, abolitionism, is to kind of freeze the story of slavery, right? And freeze the story of the opposition to what they're doing. Because the people that you're focusing on kind of tell it a particular way. So I think. One thing to keep in mind is a sort of dynamism of different sides, so to speak, as they're kind of evolving in relation to each other. Um, it, it's important to me as I'm you know, working through these, these questions because uh, the, the, the kind of response is, is as historical and as contingent, as particular, as contextual, right? Um, and that it's when one looks at it just through the lens of a particular area or angle, then you're going to get a static view of, of potentially the other side. Um, and so that's, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I think drawing from that, because so I think it would be also interesting to think not just of transnational radicalism outside of the nation state, but going back to the previous question of well, how important is the state and the, the status process is just thinking about kind of in this period of uh, Asian revolutions and going back to um, John Tukmina's point about Haiti as this really important middle point through which the age of revolution is passing through, in some ways you start to see how you have the U.S., which although the northern states had modeled a measure of emancipation, at least free wombs laws and such, 
the United States as an independent state had of course maintained slavery, Haiti much more radical, abolishes slavery. And then you have the emergence of a, of a Colombian ideal that eventually consolidates in one type of Colombia. So there's several Colombians, but the one that Bolivar is championing, even with after the support of Peyton Haiti is a gradual emancipation pre-births law that then gives that identity to a Colombia for abolition of slavery, that in the concert of geopolitical nations, in some ways a Gran Colombia needs the United States that didn't have this kind of about abolition of slavery yet completely as a nation state, and it needed a Haiti that completely abolished slavery, so it could be like a third way. And I'm, and that's kind of one of the things that that's it. It's a third way that then Great Britain is adopting as like, well, look at this model. Maybe we can do um, free births within the Caribbean context. So you, and then that can at least place it in this moment of age of revolutions where there's a lot of Colombian is one of many states that is vying for international recognition. And so its placement within um, how it's going to deal with this question of radical abolition or not of slavery is, is something that that plays a role as well. If I could put uh, suggest two sources to the questioner. One, go back to Luis Fernando Granados uh, in La Sombra, no, in El Espejo Etiano, which deals with the Haiti New Spain relationship with popular radicalism, sort of below the radar, not at an intellectual level. Recently, um, Kelly Ladler Mendes' book, Bad Mexican, was on the floor by St. Pagan, is a bestseller and um, addresses this. But beyond that, I will recommend to you if you go to the website of the Calmenovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown, we they did a panel like this on the floor of Magon and Bad Mexicans, precisely looking at it as Friends National. Um, anarchism at the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. And it explores those questions, I think, pretty interestingly, we don't solve them. Mm -hmm. Erica, you study these radical transnationals in the case of Mexico, li radical liberals like Benito Juarez, who ends up in, in New Orleans and being there, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there, is, there is this dimension to Antebellum, Mexico, and the United States, where there are these connections among radicals? No, I mean, you have to go before you have these transnational connections become much more important than others. And you don't really have radical liberals moving around. You have some very radical conservatives. And the role that the church plays, I think, in that the fact that Pius IX is the Pope of the Felix that says, Basically, liberalism is no modernism at all. Is a transnational event that shapes the way people are thinking about politics. Thank you. Well, on that point, uh, I mean, the book will end this. And, uh, uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, carry on with the conference.